Now, now to understand, so the people who are not in this room are gonna understand this. One of the cameras, pick, pick up his shirt, pick up his shirt for a second. Come on, stand there and, and, and get, him, get him on camera. The guys here have made t-shirts of, of the, uh, the, 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 uh, the newspaper story about me meeting with an alien. And so that's why they're off, they're, this is alien week at Reinhardt College. <laughs> but if I can bring you back to, to this more normal thing here, okay? This last week is getting a little punchy, I can tell. <laughs> what people do is people artificially create a framework. Now, and I'll tell you, it, it took me two years of teaching this class to figure this out. And, and one of the break points was I knew we were doing this last section wrong. And I couldn't get out of it. I mean, I kept coming in. It was too political. It was you know, political in the sense of talking about politics, talking about government, talking about citizenship writ narrowly. And then three things, actually three things happened. One was I went and talked to an Amway group, about 15,000 people. And when we left, my wife, Marianne, said to me, that speech was wrong. She said, you reduced their citizenship to voting. She said, these folks are citizens when they work all day. They're citizens when they take care of their children. They're citizens when they're involved in Boy Scouts. She said, they're putting in hours of citizenship every week, and you didn't talk to them about what they were doing right. And a light went on in my head. And I said, I think I'm beginning to understand how I'd gotten trapped inside my own nine dots here, because I didn't have a good enough definition. The second thing, which I'll show you in a second, is that Gordon Woods developed, uh, helped me understand the model that the Founding Fathers used and the Jefferson in particular used for thinking about America. And the third thing that happened was I read Olasky's book on the tragedy of American compassion. And Olasky says that in the 19th century there was so much volunteerism that there was one volunteer for every two poor people. Now you think about the scale of involvement, the number of people who thought, I better put in part of that. Remember, these folks did not have an easier life than we do. They did not work shorter hours. They didn't have more labor-saving devices at home. They didn't have fewer malls to go to. And, you know, I mean, these people put in very long hours in a fairly hard life and still found time to be volunteers and citizens because they thought it was how they defined being an American. And so I began to realize that we have been, we have been trying to solve some problems by being trapped inside the dots in a way that doesn't work. And that you've got to have the moral courage to break out and rethink it. Now, what compounded that, frankly, was uh, sitting down and having dinner one night with Dr. Gordon Woods, who's written two brilliant works. Uh, one, The uh, Origins of the American Revolution, and the other on the radicalism of the American Revolution. And as we talked, he was trying to explain to me why Jefferson so passionately believed in limited government. That it wasn't that he was just anti-government, it was that he was pro-freedom. And as we talked about it, it seemed to me you could represent it in a box that had four quadrants. But the first and most important one was culture and society. That is, when you get up in the morning, who are you? What, what expectations do you have of yourself? What expectations do you have of others? Do you expect to get up and go to work? Do you expect to obey the law? Do you expect to participate fully in your community? What, and, and what do you teach your children and your neighbors and your friends? How do you begin every day, all day, what are you modeling as a way to behave? The second was civic responsibility. that you had to have a sense of your church or your synagogue, your volunteer association, your involvement in your community, uh, your help in creating new opportunities, new philanthropies. You know, if you, if you don't have a public library, voluntarily getting together to create one. If you, Benjamin Franklin is sort of the greatest of the founding fathers of this because he, he creates the American Philosophical uh, Association, the first fire department, the first, uh, uh, I think, fire insurance company, uh, the uh, first uh, public library in, the, in North America, helps found the post office, um, and, and goes to a whole range of these things where he just, whenever he'd see a need, he'd, he'd get a group together. And so he left behind him in Philadelphia 
this trail of things where people got together because of Franklin and did something good. And, and again, you see it, for example, in the American Volunteer Fire Departments, which are a huge network of people who get together to do good things. The third box is free markets and the pursuit of happiness. Remember that Jefferson almost wrote the pursuit of property. And that the founding fathers had, in, in the Declaration of Independence, that the founding fathers had a very deep belief that you had to be able to pr own property, you had to be able to pursue better economic future. And now it's within this framework that you get limited, effective government. This is not weak government. People misinterpreted Jefferson. He is, after all, a man who uh, bought half a continent in Louisiana Purchase, sent Lewis and Clark across the continent on a scientific expedition, and sent the Marines to Tripoli. But the point is, when government gets bigger, it crowds out the other three. When government takes over the job of acculturating, so we say, well, I'm not really going to teach my children anything. That's the teacher's job. I pay taxes. Let a bureaucrat do it. When government starts trying to create jobs, which is inherently bad at when government starts to take over what historically, and this is Olasky's whole point about welfare, that government, when it becomes un unlimited, becomes ineffective, and in the process, it crowds out the free society. So what today's session is about is how do we reestablish, in particular, the core values of our culture and society, and then how do we reassert for every American civic responsibility? And we wanted to start with Chamberlain to just say, you know, how can you with any sense of moral good faith tell us you're too busy? It's too hard. It's too much. If you're going to be free, you have to be willing to bear some of the responsibility of freedom. Now, we're also not going to talk about government. We're talking about community, which is a much broader idea. Community is the broad system within which we live, which nourishes us, and upon which we depend. So we're really concerned about the entire community. And, and if you'll notice, by the way, the, the very language of the Constitution is a community language. The preamble of the Constitution says, we the people of the United States, in order to form a more perfect union, establish justice, ensure domestic tranquility, provide for the common defense, promote the general welfare, and security the blessings, secure the blessings of liberty to ourselves and our posterity do ordain and establish this Constitution for the United States of America. But notice the broad goals, the broad interest. The Founding Fathers did not intend, therefore, to automatically do all that through a bureaucracy. But they wanted a government which reinforced the general direction of society. Another way to look at it is that citizenship is the duties, obligations, rights, and responsibilities necessary to maintain community. Not necessary to maintain government. Notice the difference. This is not about paying taxes. 